Hey everybody, welcome. Uh, in this video we're going to look at how a laser operates. So this is a nice application of atomic physics and molecular physics because you can have lasers that utilize transitions among uh, the energy levels of a molecule, different states of a molecule. Uh, just like you have different states in an atom, molecules also have quantized energy levels. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and start. Now, you can find this PowerPoint presentation on our course page. If you just scroll down, you'll see a, a, a link for the laser presentation. Um, I won't show you in the video, but it's, it's there. Uh, so, first of all, um, I don't know if you guys know, but, but laser is an acronym. Of course, it's a word now. It's a verb, lazing to laze, but it is an acronym. And what it stands for is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, which is, it is redundant because the radiation is light, but I, I think we needed an R to make it uh, a noun, so we have laser. So let's talk about uh, these different terms. Uh, of course, the light and the radiation refer to electromagnetic radiation. But let's talk about stimulated emission and then see where that amplification comes into play. So what is stimulated emission? Well, it turns out there are two types of light emission that can occur. And the kind that we've been talking about really up to this point when, for instance, when we were looking at the Bohr model and the hydrogen atom making a transition from a higher state to a lower energy state and emitting a photon, that's uh, spontaneous emission. Um, Einstein was one of the people that worked on stimulated emission, which is the second type of emission that people didn't actually realize at first uh, was occurring and could, uh, could be uh, engineered with to make lasers. So what's the difference between these two? All right, so what we have here, this diagram, those horizontal lines just represent energy levels of, of an atom, let's say. And they don't have to be consecutive energy levels, but they're just energy levels. So in normal spontaneous emission, the atom becomes excited, um, and that can be an electrical excitation, an optical excitation. It can even be a collision with another atom. But the atom goes to a higher energy state, and then on its own, it'll make a transition to a lower vacant state, and in the process, emit a photon. That's called spontaneous emission. The photon will be emitted in what looks like a random direction. Okay, so that process occurs all the time in nature. We can also engineer with this uh, fluorescent lamps uh, for, and fluorescent light fixtures. That light that's given off is from a spontaneous emission of atoms. Okay, now stimulated emission is similar, except what happens is when the atom is in that excited state, if it interacts with an external photon that has just the right energy, that photon can stimulate the atom to make that transition. And in that process, the atom emits the, uh, another photon. Now, in order for this to happen, the, the incoming photon, the one that stimulates the transition, it has to have the same energy as the one that's going to be emitted. The one that's going to be emitted is going to have an energy that's the difference between this higher energy that the atom is initially in this state and that final energy of the final state. So if this incoming photon has that energy difference, uh, it, can, it can stimulate this transition. Okay, now what happens because it has to have the same energy, right, the, the, the photon that does the stimulating, the two photons that then leave the atom are going to also have the same energy, right? Uh, well, one of them is the actual one that's caused the, the uh, transition in the first place, but the one emitted by the atom will also have the same energy and therefore wavelength, same frequency as the stimulating photon. And these two photons will leave in the same direction uh, to, to conserve momentum. Okay, so that's a, that's a very important way that that light is emitted. In stimulated emission, you have the same wavelength being emitted as the stimulating photon's wavelength, and you have the photons traveling in the same direction. 
Okay, now here's a possible idea. We get a bunch of these atoms, right, excite them, and then each one is stimulated by a photon, right? They then emit photons, those excited atoms, and now we have a whole bunch of photons with the same energy and therefore wavelength, and they're traveling in the same direction. That sounds pretty much like what we think of when we uh, hear laser beam, right? A laser is uh, so-called uh, so monochromatic, right? It has one wavelength. It, it actually is not one wavelength. It's There's a very small, what's called the line width, a wavelength spread for a laser, but it's very, very, very small spread in wavelengths. So essentially it's monochromatic. And you get a beam, right? All the photons are traveling in the same direction. The problem with this idea, though, is that for most atoms and most states, most energy levels of atoms, spontaneous emission is much more likely to occur than stimulated emission. So when you excite the atom, it's much more likely that before stimulated emission has a chance to occur, that the atom is just going to quickly decay spontaneously. And in fact, I, I don't have this in, the, in this presentation, but let me just pause and go to the notebook here. You can define what are called uh, lifetimes for the different energy levels. So, and usually we use a uh, Greek tau. So, um, a, a level will have a spontaneous lifetime and a stimulated lifetime. And what you can think of these lifetimes are, these are the average times that an atom will be in that excited state, stay in that excited state before spontaneous emission occurs or stimulated emission occurs. So it's like, you know, you have your stopwatch, right? Your very, very fast stopwatch because these lifetimes are usually on the order of uh, nanoseconds, picoseconds. I mean, they can be microseconds for certain levels. Uh, but, you know, you start your stopwatch when you excite the atom to a certain level, and then you stop your stopwatch when either spontaneous uh, e uh, emission occurs or simulated emission occurs. Okay, now for most energy levels, the spontaneous lifetime is much shorter. That average lifetime is much shorter than stimulated lifetimes. Okay, so again, if you excite the atom to this energy level, it's much more likely that a spontaneous transition is going to occur very quickly. Even if you have photons that can cause stimulated emission around that atom, even if, because that's one of the things you have to have for stimulated emission, right? You have to have photons near that atom that can stimulate the transition. But even if you have those atoms around, um, usually the atom in, a, in that energy level is going to spontaneously decay. So the spontaneous lifetime is less than the stimulated lifetime. That's another way to state that. Okay, well, there is a solution though. All you have to do is you have to find certain atoms or molecules that have certain energy levels where the opposite is true. So what we're looking for is we're looking for certain levels where instead of the spontaneous lifetime being less than the stimulated lifetime, we're looking for a relatively long average lifetime for spontaneous emission. So we want the spontaneous lifetime to be greater than the stimulated lifetime. So if we have photons of the right energy around this atom, and we excite it, it is much more likely that stimulated emission will occur. Now, because we're looking for levels where the spontaneous lifetime is longer than the stimulated lifetime, right? Longer than typical spontaneous lifetimes. These states that have these energies are referred to as metastable. Whoops metastable states. It's like they, uh, you know, you excite the atom and it's like the atom just stays there for a while in that excited state. It's metastable. Okay, so that's what we mean by the metastable state. It's that energy level 
where the atom will hang out for a while, where the lifetime for spontaneous emission is relatively long. So you have a much better chance for stimulated emission to occur before spontaneous emission occurs. Okay, so what I'm going to describe and what you guys should know is what's called three-level laser operation. Although most uh, lasers use four-level laser operation, if we know how three-level works, four-level is not much more complicated. Uh, so these represent three different energy levels of an atom or molecule. And again, they don't have to be consecutive in energy, but these are the three special states. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to excite the atom from state one to state three. So we call that pumping the atom. Okay, now you use what is called an excitation source. Uh, that can be electrical, like in a gas laser. It can be a high voltage difference with uh, that gives an electrical excitation. It can be optical. A lot of lasers will use light to excite the atoms. Sometimes a laser will actually use another laser as the excitation source, uh, which sounds sort of silly, but it may be that you want a laser at a particular color or wavelength, so you have to use another laser to, to pump that particular laser's atoms. Okay, so there is that excitation to level three. Then there's going to be a quick decay from level three to level two. That's usually a spontaneous decay. So that's going to be very, very quick. But level two now is your metastable state. That's where the atom will hang out for a while. So the atom, quote, waits in the metastable state, okay? And it's waiting for a photon to interact with this atom. Now the photon has to have an energy that's the difference between level two and level one. But if that happens, the incoming photon comes in and you hope that it causes that stimulated transition. So then the atom makes the transition from two to one, right? The stimulating photon keeps traveling and the emitted photon travels in the same direction. And then once the atom is back in level one, you repeat the process, okay? now. Um, and you can show with the so-called rate equations for lasers that if you want to have this process not die out, if you want to have, have sustained lasing action, you always have to have more atoms in level two than level one. So you have to maintain a larger population in level two than level one. And there's a fancy term for that you see at the bottom of the slide here. That's called population inversion when you have more atoms in level two, the metastable state, than level one, okay? Now you might ask, you know, why, why do we need three levels? Why can't we just use two levels? Why can't we just pump directly to level two, the metastable state, and then have the transition from two to one? Well, it turns out that you can't pump efficiently to metastable states. Because they're metastable, it's very hard to excite atoms to that energy level because spontaneous emission has a really long lifetime. It's not likely to occur. It's hard to pump directly to that level. So that's why we go above to level three and then rely on a quick decay to level two. If you had four level laser operation, um, you don't have to know this, but I'll just describe it while we're here. What you would have is you would have a state below level one. We could call it level zero. So you would pump from level zero to three, quick decay to two. Two is still your metastable state, lasing transition from two to one, then another quick decay from one to zero. And that's how most conventional lasers, that's, they use a four level scheme. Um, but if you know three level, that's, that's good enough, okay? All right, so what do you need to build a laser, right? Well, first you have to have atoms with this metastable state or molecules. So the collection of those atoms or molecules we call the gain medium. All right, so that's the material with atoms or molecules that have that state and can achieve population inversion. You need a way to excite those atoms or molecules. So that's the excitation source. But then here comes the amplification part to the laser acronym. You have to have what's called a resonating cavity, which are are going to be mirrors. 
because you need some photons. In fact, the majority of the photons that are produced in these transitions, you need them to stay inside the gain medium to keep stimulating more transitions. So the way you do that is with these mirrors that form a laser cavity so that you always have these photons of the right energy bouncing back and forth stimulating more transitions. Now you have to let some of the photons out to get your laser beam so one of the mirrors won't be a perfect reflector um, and it might let out typically one or two percent of the photons so that you have this output beam but the big, a big majority of the photons bounce back and forth in that cavity to keep the stimulated emission going. Okay, and that's where the light amplification comes up because you have these photons that are constantly producing more and more and more photons. Okay, um, so here's just a little diagram showing the different parts, elements of the laser. So there's your gain medium, and we've made we have made lasers, we being the scientific community, um, that are solid, liquid, and gas. Okay, so we we've found uh, all phases of of matter uh, we can make lasers out of. Liquid lasers are a mess. It, it's not a static liquid. It's actually a jet of liquid that you have to pump with another laser. So you're only going to find those in, in research labs. This is not something you can put in a box and, and carry around with you. And the only reason you would build a liquid laser is uh, you want a particular color or frequency. Okay, and you can't find that with a solid or gas laser. Solid and gas lasers, those can be portable, right? You just have a solid material or a tube filled with the gas. The helium neon lasers that um, if you come to class, right, if I see you, uh, you we use those, uh, those red lasers, those are gas lasers. And uh, if I see you, I'll show you the insides of one of those. Okay, then you have the excitation source. Okay, so for solid laser, you're going to be using light. It doesn't have to be another laser. It could be um, just white light sometimes. Uh, old lasers used to use white light flash lamps and they were pulsed lasers so they would, they would produce pulses of light. Nowadays a lot of lasers will use um, light emitting diodes. They'll just surround the solid gain medium with light emitting diodes um, or semiconductor lasers sometimes are, are used like in laser pointers to pump uh, the, the, uh, the gain medium. Okay now liquid lasers again we'll use another laser and then gas lasers will be uh, will we'll use a high voltage to electrically excite the atoms or molecules. Okay, and then I talked about that typically in a laser cavity, the mirrors form the cavity. One mirror will be a perfect reflector, 100% reflector, and the other will be a partial reflector. So some photons can escape. And you can control the reflectivity by how thick uh, a layer of metal is deposited on the glass. Okay. All right, so some characteristics of lasers. Uh, you get a nice beam. The beam does diverge. It, it can be a very, very small divergence angle, uh, but it's a nice tight beam. It's not perfectly collimated without using some external optics. It's We mentioned it's monochromatic. It's basically one wavelength, although if you look, there is a very tiny wavelength spread, but essentially one wavelength. Uh, and you can get relatively high output powers, particularly if you operate lasers in what's called pulsed mode, where you build up a whole population, big population of photons, and then let out a very short time pulse. Okay. I, in fact, speaking of that, the two ways you can operate lasers, this is really fancy, but it, it's actually pretty simple in concept. If the beam is on all the time, that's called continuous wave. So like optical scanning, optical ranging, light displays, uh, are, you're going to use continuous wave. And then you could do pulsed wave, where short, high power pulses are emitted. So if you have to do things that require really high power, like um, ablating tissue for surgery or cutting materials, you're going to be using pulsed mode. And 
low power applications of pulsed wave operation is communication where you're sending bits zeros and ones with laser pulses okay this table just lists some and, and you can look at this at your leisure this just lists some common lasers of the different uh, types solids liquids and gases um, the ruby laser i put here because that was the first visible laser built it used a ruby crystal uh, red laser and it was built uh, 1960 okay so lasers have been around for what now about 60 years okay uh, neodymium YAG laser that stands for neodymium um, is in is put into while it's growing a crystal of yttrium aluminum garnet so it's I don't, I don't know what goes into a garnet crystal but um, you grow this crystal with yttrium aluminum garnet and there's some neodymium in there too. That's a common laser used in medical applications. It's infrared, near infrared, right around one micron. Uh, Thai sapphire lasers, sapphire crystals with titanium are very popular in research labs also because they actually are tunable. Uh, they can laze on different transitions. So you can get several different visible transitions uh, with uh, Thai sapphire. And then some gas lasers, um, I mentioned the helium neon, argon ion is a common one. It's also tunable. You can get pretty high power, around 10 watts or so, okay, which is pretty powerful laser. Um, I think I mentioned before the little helium neon gas lasers we use for demos are around uh, 5 or 7 milliwatts, okay. And uh, carbon dioxide, regular old CO2 does have a, a, a lasing transition. It's in the far infrared of about 10.6 microns. Um, carbon dioxide lasers can be extremely powerful uh, up to around 1,000 watts. So you can use them to cut things and medical applications. They're very inefficient though, um, relatively speaking. So you have to pump them with a lot of energy. A lot of energy goes in to get that output energy out, the, the power out. And then excimer lasers um, are used in medical applications, and those are um, fluoride uh, compounds, okay, and they, they laser in the ultraviolet. Okay, um, oh, semiconductor lasers, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about, I mean, in fact, I'm, I'm just going to let you read about semiconductor lasers. Let me just say that semiconductor lasers, the kind that you find in laser pointers, right, that's probably the most popular place that you, you see these. Um, well, I mean, that's not true. <laughs> if you have a DVD or CD player, you're going to have a semiconductor laser in there. The lasing process is a little bit different in a semiconductor laser. Um, I, I, if you're an electrical engineer or I, if you guys have taken electronics, I don't know if in circuits you talk about diodes. These are actual diodes, but they emit light, they emit stimulated emission. So the process is a little bit different. These are not individual atoms or molecules. Um, these are electrons in what's called the conduction band making a transition to what's called the valence band. And I throw those terms out there only because you guys may have discussed these if you've had a class talking about PN junctions and diodes. Uh, semiconductor lasers um, are, are very, can be very, well, they are very tiny. I mean, extremely small and relatively high output power. So um, you see them uh, replacing conventional gas lasers all over the place. Like we used to use for barcode scanning, we used to use uh, helium neon lasers, but now we use red laser diodes. So the scanning heads are very, very, very small. Okay, um, but, but those are used again in a lot of read-write technologies. Okay, um, and in fiber communication. Okay, I'll let you read about that, uh, just scan these. You're not responsible for this. Uh, these are the different material systems that semiconductor lasers use. And this is one, th this shows a top view of a, a gallium medium phosphide, aluminum gallium medium phosphide laser. And I just want to mention the dimensions. This is one that I, I actually made as part of my graduate work years ago. Um, but the size of it, it's only 0.03 millimeters wide, 0.3 millimeters long, 
and its total thickness is about a tenth of a millimeter, so extremely small. Okay, uh, these t last couple tables are just taken from an old laser book, just talking about where you see lasers being used and some characteristics of some common lasers. All right, I've talked too much about this. You can look at these tables if you want, but that's it. Now, look at the summary notes. Um, no, don't look at the summary notes because it'll just say, look at this PowerPoint, right? Where you should look at the, is at those quantum physics study questions. You guys remember those quantum physics study questions? Let me real quick just go to our, our, uh, our course page. So you can find those if you go to test study questions, click on the online format for test two. Those quantum physics study questions are right here. Okay, and some of those questions deal with lasers and laser operation. Okay, so you make sure you know the, the, the answers to those. Okay, all right, that's it. Bye-bye.